أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وآله الطاهرين May he hasten the Raya Fairness for awaited him. I welcome you from the minor land, minor land of Fadak, where I'm a presenter, Ali Ibrahim, alongside Muhammad al Sultan. And I welcome Sheikh Yasser al Habib to continue on with his research papers. On this holy night, happy night, the day of Al Ghazi. The title is Listen and Do Not Talk. Why did Ahmed ibn Hanbal fear uh, the narration of Al Ghadir? And he said, Be silent and do not talk. تقدم بالأمس كلام صاحب حيث اعترف أول We spoke in the past about or previously about the narration of Al-Ghadir and when which uh, it was confirmed and declared authentic including the addition and I mean by the addition on the Prophet Peace be upon him and his family said Allah is an enemy to those who are his enemies and an ally to those who are his allies and he responded to Ibn Taymiyyah or refuted the claims of Ibn Taymiyyah who, who said this narration was weak and also went so far as to say that this edition was fabricated and it was falsified and inserted and it goes against the foundations of Islam as he uh, put and but however al -Haytami, while uh, in uh, the pursuit of uh, refutation of the beliefs of the Shia he uh, spoke or uh, focused on two points to uh, refute our beliefs first point was Claiming that this narration does not reach the level of Tawatur. Even though he claimed or believes, did say that this narration is authentic. But he said that it has not reached the level of Tawatur because he claimed that we have used this as a foundation of our belief while we claim that. Uh, for something to be a foundation for belief, it must be a tawatur. Because if there is anything about usul or foundations, uh, the principles of our faith, then there must be uh, tawatur involving that belief. And yesterday we did uh, respond to these uh, claims uh, with what the uh, opposer scholars th themselves have said. Some uh, that we've shown, some said or admitted, like Al-Ajluni, that the narration is or has reached the Tawatur level. 
even Albania and Dhabi themselves, those uh, scholars uh, have admitted that this narration has reached the level of Tawatur. At the very least, its first segment, and I mean by that, in which the Prophet said, those who see me as their authority, then Ali is their authority. Al-Ajluni also did admit that Allah uh, is an, an enemy to those who are his enemies. This is also, uh, or has also reached Tawatur. So as you've seen, this uh, claim that this narration has not reached the level of Tawatur has been uh, refuted previously. The second point uh, in which uh, he focused, or he, the point he focused on to uh, refute our beliefs, it was his attempt to discuss uh, the meanings of the hadith itself, the narration. Uh, who says that the narration uh, pinpoints this matter and that is that uh, Imam Ali is the, auth the legitimate successor of the uh, Prophet. In his book, in volume 1, uh, page 108, he says, we do not accept that the term Mawla uh, means what the uh, Shia have claimed. Mawla means a person that has been aided or championed as if he is saying those who I have aided then Ali will also aid them and I think you all here agree how uh, silly these statements are or these explanations are the Prophet gathers all those people in this specific location and uh, the heat and gets up and even those who were leaving he asked them to come back this is a very important statement he wanted all to hear and according to the opposer's narration there was things being said about Ali at that time peace be upon him and doubts were, were being placed against him then the Prophet stood up, peace be upon him, and his family said, Do not, I not take prominence over the believers? They said, yes. And then he goes on to say, those who have aided, then uh, Ali will aid. It's not in the same context. The context here was that uh, Ali was being put in a place where he is now the target of uh, aid and uh, support, not the one who gives it, at any rate. Uh, the author says, because Al-Mawla saying that it means Imam or successor, it was never seen that way, uh, not linguistically and not according to our Sharia laws. He denies that the term Mawla uh, means Imam, successor. It is not correct linguistically or based on Sharia laws. Uh, our response to this uh, statement is what does Imam actually mean? Or what is the purpose of being declared an Imam? Imam is someone who is uh, put in a position of leadership to lead and it's surprising what Al Ibn Hajar al Haytami has said uh, because this term was used in that context uh, linguistically and uh, in accordance with Sharia laws. In terms of language, uh, in Lisan al-Arab, uh, in the description of Wali and all uh, other uh, terms extracted of it, Al-Farra said, Al-Mawali are the people who inherit a man and his cousins. Also, he said, Wali, Mawla, is the same thing, uh, or had the same meaning in the tongue of the Arabs. And I put this underneath, uh, a line underneath this, because it's important, I want to come back to it later. Wali and Mawla means the same thing uh, uh, when Arabs use it. Abu Mansur said, 
our master, the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him and his family, has said, any woman that had in intercourse without the permission of the man who owned her, and some has said Mawla and some said Wali because they have the same meaning. It's a known narration that the opposers have in their own sources and it was uh, reported two different ways with the term Mawla or sometimes uh, with the permission of uh, Wali or the authority and the authority upon her because they had the same meaning. Ibn Salam uh, narrated of Yunus Al Mawla uh, had its place in the usage of the Arabs, uh, language usage of the Arabs. First, the Mawla in religion, the authority. And it is Allah's statement Allah is the authority of those who believe, and the disbelievers have no authority upon them. And it is also the statements of the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, who said, those who I am their authority, Ali is their authority. Meaning, those who I led. Here, they try also to soften the impact of the term and trying to get out of the meaning that it refers to the uh, overarching authority of Islam. Uh, would that need a declaration by the Prophet, peace be upon him? At the very least, Ali is a Muslim. Of course, he, uh, uh, that, that statement the Prophet made in such a specific manner had a certain value to it. That the Prophet, uh, it required the Prophet to make that statement and that declaration. Was there doubt that uh, Ali uh, was was not any uh, did not deserve the aid and support or give aid and support of any other Muslim if you said if you doubted that the Prophet would have to take the stance and deliver a speech to declare that Ali is a Muslim that you can take your faith from him it means all those people were hypocrites and oppressors because they are claiming Ali was not a Muslim and that the Prophet had to make that declaration to confirm that he was a Muslim. Of course this is unacceptable, an unacceptable explanation. At any rate, let's continue on with how this word was used and the purpose of its usage. Abu Haytham said Mawla uh, could have six different meanings definitions Mawla could be in, mean a cousin and the uncle and the brother and the son and uh, the family members and also means someone who aids you also Mawla in the context of authority an authority who will lead you it is known in the language Mawla. So how could Ibn Hajar claim that Mawla, the term Mawla, was not used linguistically uh, in the context of authority or leadership? As for Sharia laws, and they mean by that what the reports they have between their hands it's sufficient in this place. This uh, famous uh, narration reported by Muslim in his Sahih 3302. It's a long narration. We used it many times for different purposes of Malik, of Zuhri, that Malik ibn Awas. Malik ibn Aws uh, said to him, he said, Umar ibn al-Khattab sent after me and I came, when I came, it was around uh, uh, noon. 
and then or afternoon and then Umar uh, spoke to Ali and Al Abbas peace be, upon, peace be upon Ali then he said the following when the messenger of Allah peace be upon him and his family died Abu Bakr said I am uh, the successor after the messenger of Allah. He used the term wali. Abu Bakr said, I am the wali. I am the successor. In this context, it doesn't mean I am uh, the one who aids him, the one who is part of his family. In this context, he's stating that he's the authority after the messenger of Allah. Peace be upon him and his family. Uh, and his family and you came to, to me asking the heritage of your cousin and he's asking the heritage of his wife or inheritance of his wife but the prophet Abu Bakr said the prophet peace be upon him and his family said we do not leave inheritance behind and for that you saw him a liar and a, a betrayer but Allah knows he's truthful and he followed and uh, and uh, carried out the justice <coughs> at any at the very least this is of course embarrassing for the opposers because the look they have or the way Ali and Abbas ibn Muttalib saw uh, Abu Bakr, uh, he's, they saw him as a liar, a sinner, and a treacherous person, and a corrupt person, and the narration is authentic. Then Abu Bakr died, and I, uh, in reference to himself, Umar, and I. Um, successor of the Prophet and Abu Bakr. What does he mean in this context? It's a reference to leadership. That is what he's referring to. And then you saw me, a liar, a sinner, a treacherous person. And Allah knows I am truthful and I am on the good path so on and so forth so you've seen how and the context in which wali was used this term uh, meaning leadership and authority and this is what those who explained or did the sharh of Sahih Muslim this was not only found in Sahih Muslim by the way but anyway the those who uh, explained or did sharh of uh, Sahih Muslim in, um, Nal Abad, for example, Sunani Abu Dawood, same narration, 2963. In, in that book, in Sunan Abu Dawood by Al Abad, volume 4, 349, and he said Abu Bakr, when he uh, took his place, the place of the Prophet, he said, I am the wali of the Prophet, successor. It, the, the meaning is very clear for everyone, uh, for everyone to understand. I am the wali of the Prophet, peace be upon him after. And I will do as I see fit with the money, the wealth he has left, as he himself has done in his life. Then Umar, uh, when Abu Bakr died he took leadership uh, and he did uh, disseminate the, the wealth that he had or Abu Bakr had uh, as Abu Bakr did and, and the messenger of Allah did before him so the use of wali the term of wali meaning or in the context of authority and leadership has been uh, or has its place in Sharia law 
and there are examples of it. And we have also learned that based on language usage, that Wali and Mawla have the same meaning. Therefore, uh, Ibn Hajar al means claims that linguistically or even based on Sharia law itself, the term Mawla never meant authority. Especially since you will be uh, completely defeated by the following. Because some might come along and try to say that the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, did not say, if I I am your authority, then Ali is your authority. He said, if I am your Mawla, he didn't say Wali. We say to you, but will defeat this argument entirely. Even this wording is also reported of the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him and his family. As we found in specifically with the following uh, wording, uh, when I, when I, who those who I am wali, their wali, Ali is their wali. And this narration is authentic. Albani, he admitted so in Sahih al Jama'. Also, Sha'ib al Arnaud admitted that Al Wadi admitted this is authentic, so on and so forth. As you see on the screen, number 6,534. Uh, Those who I am their Wali, Ali is their Wali. And he said, commented, Sahih. So this term or this terminology was used in both in both ways so after all this uh, the claim of uh, Hajar has been shown to be utterly false saying that uh, Mawla or, uh, or Wali have never been used linguistically or even based on Sharia laws and, and its reports that we have used in the context of authority and leadership if this is the state of your scholars, then you should really weep for yourselves. With all honesty, this is the extent of their knowledge. So, so easily deny something. Uh, that this term, for example, was not used linguistically or uh, uh, based on Sharia law to mean authority when he has all this evidence in front of him. Uh, like the uh, Mu'jam al-Arab and other and other uh, sources or uh, did he not know all of these sources or did he just completely try to avoid them because they are related to Ali peace be upon them is it because they hate for Ali's uh, right to Imam is confirmed uh, in any way or shape so that's why we run in circles and try all we can uh, to take the meaning of Hadith al-Ghadir, narration of al-Ghadir, out of context and not in its, uh, out of its own original purpose. Every person, sensible person, would know that in here, the context was authority. Specifically, if you look at the, uh, the way this narration or this report started, when the Prophet himself said, do I, na do I not take prominence? Am I uh, not uh, the most valuable to you? Then, if that is the case, then Ali is your Mawla. Who is more valuable than you personally? It's the person who leads you and the authority atop you. No one is more important than yourself, except the one whose position is more sensitive than yours. Uh, the, the first Mawla of Islam, uh, and, uh, is the first Mawla is the Messenger of Allah peace be upon him and his family and he himself said since I am your authority and as I am your authority then Ali is your authority there is no other clearer terms or words the Prophet could have used it is only the stubbornness of our opposers and it is only their attempts to avoid the truth and uh, de complete denial of the truth and uh, 
believe me uh, when I say if it was not the clear meaning of this narration then the opposers preachers would not have been so sensitive uh, about uh, discussing the, the, the impacts uh, or the meanings of this narration they don't want to even open the way to this uh, or to discussing this narration's meanings and one of them is the imam of the Salafis Ahmad ibn Hanbal may Allah's damnation be upon him this man uh, directly when it came to the narration of Al-Ghadir he was asked when he was asked about what, what it means and its purpose he would become nervous and close that door to understanding this narration and he would say without shame leave this be be silent and do not talk and this has been confirmed and that did, Ahmed ibn Hanbal did actually make those statements and it is a scandal and the reason I say it's a scandal is because if you are truly a scholar a true expert of a field it would not harm you when someone would come to you and ask you about something you're the expert of the narrations of the Prophet peace be upon him did he say things that we do not understand we cannot comprehend we have narrations of the Prophet peace be upon him and his family we don't want to understand what the words of this narration mean we need to return to those who are experts the scholars you're one of them but when we ask you you uh, shut us up and tell us or order us not to speak about hadith al-ghadir what were you worried about what do you fear that will be exposed if the narration uh, was or the meaning of the narration was something simple as the opposers try to claim these days say no this narration doesn't mean imam or authority it's simply all it's saying is that a prophet saying he's someone who loves or someone who supports those who love me then Ali is someone they should love that's all it meant yeah we all love Ali so this case is closed now it's not what you imagine if it truly was simple and easy as you claim then why did Ahmed ibn Hanbal uh, reject or deny that question to be asked? What did he fear uh, when what he feared to be exposed? Uh, what Hadith al-Ghadir would have revealed? You would ask me where, of course, this narration or this evidence exists that Ahmed ibn Hanbal said, do not speak. In Kitab al-Sunnah, Ahmed ibn al-Khalal, 400 and 58 Zakaria ibn Yahya uh, told me that Abu Talib Abu Talib and Mishkani the companion or friend of Ahmed told them that he asked Abu Abdullah Ahmed ibn Hamil's nickname of the messenger of Allah's peace be upon him and his family's statement or declaration to Ali those who arm their authority Ali is their authority or Mawla then Ali is their Mawla what does that mean? he said do not speak about this let this narration be as it is and leave it you can see with your own eyes Highlight it or anything so people read so people can see. This is Ahmed ibn Hanbal, the deceiver. Deceiver who tried to conceal what these words meant by the Prophet, peace be upon them, and denied your right to understand them. Is it not obligatory for Muslim? That if you were to learn or hear a messenger of Allah's narration, that he must learn it so that he can carry out his instructions. But then when you say to an individual, do not talk about it, do not mention it, leave this narration be. 
what are you attempting to hide? What meaning are you trying to conceal from this deceived nation? So let's continue the next incident in Kitab al-Sunnah by this author, uh, 459. Muhammad ibn Abi Harun said to me that Muthanna told them that he asked Aba Abdullah, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, what do you say of a man who says to another, you are the Mawla of the Prophet. They try to come from an indirect way just so they learn what Ahmed ibn, Ham, Ahmed, Ahmed ibn Hanbal thinks of that narration that used the term Mawla. So they made uh, this hypothetical example. Okay, you do not want to answer about or speak about the hadith al-Ghadir. But let's say, imagine, a man come to another and he says to you, you are the Mawla of the Prophet. He, even that causes fear for him because he's afraid that it will, his answer will lead to an answer for the hadith al-Ghadir. What do you say of a man who says to another man, you are the Mawla of the Prophet? So what do you say? What is your answer? He said, leave it. Don't open that door. We will be in huge trouble and will be truly lost. And even worse, some might say, because this narration, Hadith al Ghadir, the Mawla term has been discussed many, many times and many statements were made about it. So Ahmed ibn Hanbal did not want to approach that topic. The word of al-Mawla ad has many meanings, different contexts, different meanings. So he did not want to get or take part in this involved in, in, in this discussion. But then the answer is in the following incident. Ahmed ibn Hanbal still said, leave it and do not speak about it. Despite the differences, 460, all this come after each other. Four, uh, four incidents have been reported in Kitab al-Sunnah. Abu Bakr told us, Abu Bakr al-Marwadi told us, I've asked Abu Abdullah, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, but the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, and his family meant when he said, you are to me as Harun was to Musa. What is its explanation? He said, uh, do not talk about this. Do not ask about this report. It's been reported as has been relayed. Do not ask about this report. Only this narration. Only the narrations, because they relate to Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace be upon him. Anything to do with Ali ibn Abi Talib, they said, do not ask about it. Be silent. Forget them. <coughs> Next incident, 461. Same one we have... Uh, mentioned earlier, the first one, uh, but in a different way. Ahmed ibn Namatar, that Abu Talib said to them, said, I've asked Abu Abdullah of uh, what the Messenger of Allah, blessings and peace be upon him, meant when he said to Ali, those who uh, are their Mawla, then Ali is their Mawla. What does that mean? He said, do not talk about this and simply ignore or leave this narration as it was. Do not open the door to this discussion. And all of these things are sahih, authentic. If you could actually uh, show on the screen as a comment. So anyone who tries to deny these things happened, that Ahmed did not say, no, it is all authentic. Ahmed did say those things. It was declared as authentic. 458, for example. First um, report we mentioned. 400. Okay, the next page it says this chain of transmission is authentic. 
460 as well. And let's see what the comment was. Of course, commentator is what? Atiyah bin Atiq al Zahrani. The person who did the tahqiq or the review of, of this book says its chain of transmission is authentic uh, or correct uh, about even this narration they have a problem with it when the prophet said Ali you're to me like Harun was to Musa even this narration he says do not explain it it's not allowed to uh, look at what it means and try to understand it 461 uh, was the comment of the reviewer it said this matter is authentic so now you should really ask yourself why this narration specifically Ahmed ibn Hanbal deprive you, deprives you of uh, knowing uh, or having knowledge of its uh, meanings or, or to know what, it, what or how to explain it. What did he want to conceal? If the narration had or, or it was simple to understand or simple to explain and it would not give anything for the Shia to use against us, then why would he close that uh, door to having any knowledge of what it could mean? Why did he also fear the narration that showed the position of Imam Ali, peace be upon him, the narration of Harun and Musa? Why did they fear Ali being seen in such an image uh, by the nation? Why does he want this truth to be omitted and forgotten? Why does he uh, act in a similar manner to what the people or the followers of the books or the Ibrahimic religions of the concealments they've committed those who conceal what Allah has revealed in his book and use it to make uh, money or uh, little money with they eat or well, they are only eating hell in their stomachs. And Allah will not speak to them in the day of resurrection. And will not forgive them. And they will be punished severely. Those who uh, you decided to uh, buy, mis uh, to mislead themselves instead of guidance. They will not endure hell. Because Allah has revealed this book. And those who had disagreed upon this book will be uh, punished severely. We must not disagree when it comes to the Sunnah and the Kitab of Allah, the Book of Allah. Otherwise, you'll be, be like the Christians and the Jews. Jews, for example, uh, were like this. Sometimes they would deny or conceal or omit the statements of the holy book sometimes they would innovate or uh, uh, insert things or even change its meanings though that does not mean that the Muhammad peace be upon him and his family was the prophet they tried to change its meanings and Ahmed ibn Hanbal and his uh, ilk have done the same when it came to the sunnah and the prophet's narrations so they will not endure and cannot endure Allah's punishment there is a narration regarding this matter by the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family that we will uh, relay uh, to you, in which he condemned how Ali will be oppressed by this nation. And he foretold that, and how they will deny his rights and his succession, and all of his deeds. The greatest messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, and his family, as Ibn Abbas has reported of him in Mashariq Anwar al Yaqeen, uh, 
الحافظ المرسي he said Allah will not punish this creation uh, except with the deeds of the scholars or the most knowledgeable of this nation those who know what Ali has uh, the, the rights of Ali and they deny it or conceal it they know that no one walked this earth after the prophets and the messengers better than the Shia of Ali and those who loved him those who uh, declare his rights for all to know and to see and follow it and follow him do you know your value in the eyes of Allah or the, in the eyes of the messenger of Allah peace be upon him and his family why does the prophet holds you in such a high regard because he knows his nation those preachers who call themselves scholars like Ahmed ibn Hanbal and others they will strive to conceal the justice and the rights of Ali and his deeds and, his, uh, and all that belongs to him. You want dunya, don't take the side of Ali. You want the hereafter, take the side of Ali. Most people choose uh, dunya, so let them endure hell. They want now and they ignore the hereafter the prophet knows his nation will rebel against Ali Nabi Talib peace be upon them it will refuse him as their authority not just that they will try to conceal that reality and did deny it and if it cannot do that it will try to misinterpret things and uh, take things out of context or to prevent people from knowing. Don't talk about hadith of Ghadir. Do not talk about the position of Ali's narration and what that could mean. That is not allowed. Do not speak about it. So the Prophet knows, peace be upon him and his family. This will be the consequence of the actions of this nation, except a few loyal followers who do all they can to uh, reveal to the world that Ali is the man to follow and that he's the true leader of this faith after the Prophet. Allah will punish this nation with the deeds of the scholars that conceal the truth about Ali and his family, peace be upon them. No one walked on this earth after the messengers of the prophets better than the followers and the Shia of Ali and those who loved him those who made make public and declare the rights of Ali to everyone Allah will have mercy upon them and the angels will ask Allah to forgive them now we are in a place that Allah will encompass us with his mercy and the angels will ask Allah to forgive us because we are an opposition voice against this deceit and these uh, uh, concealments of the truth to the spreading of ignorance because we so it's our duty to uh, for everyone to know that Ali uh, is the uh, the rightful uh, successor after the Prophet peace be upon him and the Prophet says woe to those who conceal the rights of Ali and conceal the deeds of Ali they will endure hellfire Ahmed ibn Hanbal is among those who strove to conceal the rights of Ali otherwise what other meaning can we give to him saying do not speak about this do not talk about it do not try to uh, understand what the Prophet meant when he said, those who are their authority, Ali is their authority. And do not talk about what the Prophet meant when he said to Ali, you are to me as Harun was to Musa, except there is no Prophet after me. And this question must be asked to our opposers. Those who we ask Allah to guide. And we say to them, 
do you have no fear of Allah in your heart? And if you did, then you should leave these sick instructions that you've inherited and you followed uh, from or by Ahmad ibn Hanbal and people like him. Can you endure hell? Do you not ask yourself why Ahmad ibn Hanbal feared uh, that this narration and its meanings were known to people? There is no convincing answer except that he knew that if people started discussing Hadith al-Ghadir, if there was debates, then of course the conclusion will end up in, uh, in the favor of truth. People will see they will be presented several meanings. Some will say it means champion, aider. Some say it means someone who you love. Things are silly and weak for people to see. Except the meaning that states, or the explanation that states, it is in reference or the context of authority. Ahmed ibn Hanbal knew that his faith, his uh, Ideology cannot withstand the the uh, um, explanations that the Shia have provided. That's why he says, "Do not discuss this." And I say, by Allah, if he was confident about himself and his beliefs, he would not have deprived people of speaking about this. And today, you or people who claim they are Salafis, uh, how do you? Uh, Allow yourself to discuss what this uh, hadith or narration means. Your Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal says, do not talk about it. He says, you're not allowed to talk about it. He was asked, what does uh, the statements of the Prophet mean? Those who are their mawla, then Ali is their mawla. He said, do not talk about it. Leave this narration be. He was asked also, what did the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, mean when he said Ali, to Ali, you are to me as Harun was to Musa. Do not ask about this. Leave this report at his, as it was found. So you have no right now. You're not permitted as a humbly follower or the Salafi now known. You do not have permission. You're not permitted by Ahmed ibn Hanbal to speak about uh, the narration of uh, Al-Ghadir. You shouldn't come along and try to discuss it. You should be silent. Ahmed ibn Hanbal gave you that order. You have no right to say that it means supporter or someone who you love. Any meaning that could have. You have no right to discuss it. Discuss it. This is how we put our opposers in a bad position. Just like those low lives who called us some Salafis. He thinks knowledge is that if he will just raise, grow his beard and, and he puts this uh, hat, the Jewish hat on his head and thinks himself a knight and that he will come along to fight the uh, Shia. We embarrassed him by saying that your Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal said you cannot debate the Shia. Do not say uh, with that I am trying to uh, show the truth or anything all the Salaf in the past they said it's not permitted to talk about the deviant sects uh, of course they say or claim we are deviant and we are at the heads of this deviancy so if the de debate on a Shia is haram of course it is not permitted in any form or shape but those low lives who call like that person who called he said a Moroccan person, he said, he said, I know our, our fatwas and edicts more than you. My, our scholars fatwa. But then we do not see this. Uh, the opposite. When I saw you, the, I showed him the fatwas and the edicts. He, he didn't have an answer. He doesn't know what's in his books. No, I know more about your books and your scholars than you do. You are all low lives, valueless people who don't know anything about your own faith it requires me to teach you and another said something uh, funny actually uh, it made me laugh and he said the fatwa changes in time because of ch time changes and place changes this rule 
claimed. Well, did he come from, where did it come from? Ahmad ibn Hanbal and others from the Salaf did not make this condition. And also on top of that, who gave you the edict? Even the modern day scholars, and I, I've also reported uh, or uh, relayed them uh, when I was debating that Maghrabi deceiver, Adil Ataf. Even the modern Salafi scholars said it is not permitted. So who gave you permission? You are a child, still a baby, and you say, no, fatwa change in time, based on time and location. Who gave you that fatwa? Give me a fatwa from one of your prominent scholars who gives you permission uh, to debate with us. Otherwise, you have committed a great sin. Unless you would go along and say, I will give myself a fatwa, an edict. Then you will uh, become your own scholar now. You're on the same level of Ahmed ibn, Amba, Ahmed ibn Hanbal and his, the level, the same level of the scholars. Truly those children have grown. They, they have now reached a level that they can issue edicts for themselves. And you're so small. You're this tiny. So we embarrass them with this, of course. You, maybe, uh, now someone would to speak and try to discuss or talk about what Al-Ghadir means. Anyone who calls, anyone, if you allow the calls now is of an opposer and say, no, Hadith Al-Ghadir is something else. Not what you have uh, established. Or it doesn't mean authority, it means something else. You say, now, with your call, you have committed uh, two sins. One, you talking about Hadith Al-Ghadir, but your Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal said, not permitted, do not speak about this. This narration, you, it must not be discussed. You remain silent, but you're talking now about it. So you're going against the edicts issued by your Imam. At another level, is that you're also debating us. Ahmed ibn Hanbal said, it is not permitted to debate Shia and Rafida and deviant sects, so on and so forth. So what's left for you? They're really now in a bad place. They're like someone who swallowed a sharp blade. He say, sees that his faith is collapsing. Why? Because sh Shia strike, strikes are very pow powerful. A, a, a hydrogen bomb and then a nuclear bomb and a, so on and so forth. Like, strike after strike that leaves nothing for this faith left standing but on the other place on the other side when he was to defend this faith they tell him you're not allowed so at least let me explain what this hadith means they say do not speak about it. don't ever discuss it don't talk about hadith al-ghadir or manzila you will expose us if you did so what can an opposer do in this situation Uh, they're really poor, honestly. Uh, thank you, Sheikh. May Allah bless you. Uh, and what you have said, Sheikh, that Sheikh al Saduq has said in a narration of Ahmed ibn Hanbal, who said, Sunni is not truly a Sunni if he does not hate Ali even a little. And what you've seen today. Uh, is confirmation of what Sheikh al-Saduq has said. Uh, even if they have not reported it in their sources. But when you look at the history of this man, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, that he is his heart, he harbored hate to Ali, peace be upon him. Otherwise, he had no reason to deprive people of even asking a question. Asking a question about what the Prophet meant with his words. What did he mean? I want to understand that that is not permitted, but why? So that this truth is not revealed, that Ali, peace be upon him, is an Imam, the rightful Imam of all Muslims. You cannot hide these things. If you want to find out the truth, it will, the rightful position of Ali will never be 
omitted or, or concealed from them. They will see it clearly. Despite all their attempts to do it, they still remain. And we still have them today. And they will one by one will be revealed. And that's just a little of what has been or has reached us. I remind you, you can call, participate uh, and respond to this question. First, why does Ahmed ibn Hanbal instruct his students to not ask about what uh, if I was their Mawla, Ali is their Mawla. We want to know the reason. It's, it is not like the, the narrations of Sifat, uh, the qualities of Allah that they say do not speak about them, try to understand them, so on and so forth. The other is Ahmed ibn Hanbal said do not try to find out what it means even. So why do you even call us and try to make or have these discussions with us? We have a call from Muhammad from Morocco. Peace be upon you. Brother Muhammad, why did Ahmed ibn Hanbal instruct his students not to ask about what Hadith al-Ghadir or narration of Ghadir means? Dear sir, I say, after asking Allah's blessings and peace and prayers upon Muhammad and his family, and I uh, wish to send my regards to you and Sheikh Al-Habib. Dear brother, these are reported of these people. And there are many examples of them, Ahmed ibn Hanbal and others. These people, brother, They harbored hate and were enemies of Ahl al-Bayt, peace be upon them. As Sheikh has described, I, I say to you that Allah, glory be to him, is a witness to everything and truth were revealed. I will try to summarize my words. Some of the uh, Shias, as is known, I, I honestly cannot understand what Sheikh, the, the, apologies, the brother is saying. I do not understand your words. I apologize. I, I apologize. I ask him to forgive me. Uh, brothers, you're saying he said good things. But I apologize. I can't understand what you're saying. Even yesterday. So if you could, uh, be, uh, or if you're able to have calls, so we can understand. And we have a call now from uh, Brother Muhammad from Switzerland. Peace be upon him. Brother Muhammad, my question is, why did Ahmed ibn Hanbal instruct the students to not ask or discuss Hadith al-Ghadir and order them to not to talk. And I thank you for the question, but I do not want to uh, uh, participate, but I just wanted to uh, thank Sheikh Habib. From yesterday I was trying to call and I could not reach Sheikh Habib. Sheikh now here is you. I became a Shia from Baghdad, from Iraq. And I'd love to thank Sheikh directly because to me he's like a spiritual father. I've lost my father, my biological father, and, and my father was Shia, my mother was so called Sunni from 10 years old, and my father passed away. And then my mother took it upon himself to raise me. And as you know, our beliefs are instilled upon us by our family. So I was raised with the so called Sunni faith despite the fact that my father was Shia. And I would be, it was necessary that I uh, would remain Shia. From 2020, I was watching Sheikh Al-Habib and his videos and others, like my, and other channels. And it had an impact on me. It had a massive impact on me. So I wanted to continue my research 
and then I uh, seen Lady Zahra peace be upon her film the Lady of Heaven and that left even bigger impact on me and 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 I left so-called Sunnism and became a Shia and became a follower of Imam Ali peace be upon him and this is with the blessing of Allah and blessings of the Sheikh and I don't want anything except to say or send my regards to Sheikh because I think he I owe him much and I ask Allah that he as a servant of Zahra peace be upon her to be uh, given a place alongside her in heaven despite my mother being a so-called Sunni she is very ex an extremist my mother fortunately and she is uh, despite that I've lived in a so-called Sunni environment my family is from Al Jibur tribe anyone who says we love Ahl al Bayt they're lying they all lie the so-called Sunnah when they claim we love Ahl al Bayt we love Ali we love Fatim they're lying they're lying they have Umar and Aisha as their uh, highest examples I've lived as a Sunni and this is my testimony they have Umar Allah forbid to them he's more sacred than the messenger of Allah peace be upon him and his family and I do not want to take more of your time I just want to thank Sheikh Habib because he's like my spiritual father Sheikh Yasser Habib I thank you very much and I consider you my spiritual father and our youth those who lost their fathers uh, their youth to me you're my father and I you are my uh, for me you bring me honor I thank you dear brother and I ask him to strengthen you and to give you more of of his light and to have mercy on you and I ask that Allah will guide your mother too and your brothers and your tribes or your tribe and this is not uh, something that's hard to imagine you should do your best and Allah will guide you and will support you and you we un, we are honored by you brother brother do you want to declare your sh shahada I want to start with Sheikh because his words are a, are a blessing Sheikh is with you now and he will recite uh, you can recite alongside him the shahada we say with the blessings of Allah testify there is no there is no God but Allah and there is uh, no associate alongside him and that is there is nothing equal to him and there is nothing similar exalted be he I testify that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah that he is the last of the messengers and the prophets the master of all of Allah's creations and I, ex I exonerate him of any sins and uh, corrupt things and ask Allah's peace and blessings be upon him I testify that Ali is the commander of the believers peace be upon him I testify that Ali I testify that Fatima and her infallible sons are the authorities of Allah. Peace be upon them. I dissociate to Allah. Of Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Aisha and Hafsa. And all other enemies of Ahl al enemies of Ahl al Bayt, peace be upon them. I testify that Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Aisha and Hafsa are in hell. May Allah's blessings and prayers be upon Muhammad and his pure family.
Congratulations, dear brother. Everyone here is sending their regards and congratulating you for you walking the right path and deciding to follow Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. And Sheikh Habib, I, I want to request something. You, I see you as a father and a blessing. Ask, I want to ask you to pray for my mother that Allah will guide her. Allah bless you. Thank you, dear brother. Uh, and may Allah reward you and congratulate you for your return to your original faith, the faith of your father who passed away when, while you were a child. And it only shows, it goes to show that your pure origins, brother, that you would return to Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, after all this time. I remind you, brothers, that you may call and we give priority to the opposers, especially those who are the followers of Ahmed ibn Hanbal. And we want them to answer this question. Why did Ahmed ibn Hanbal instruct his students not to talk about Hadith al ghadi Why did he fear or was what, what worried him about explaining what Hadith al ghadi meant? We want to know the reasons. If this narration, Hadith al Ghadir, does not, or its meanings does not support what the Shia have said, that Ali is the successor of the Messenger of Allah and the true authority. And the proof is that what the Prophet has said in Ghadir Khum. Then, if that was not the case, why did Ahmad ibn Hanbal instruct his students not to talk about this? Not talk about what it means. Sheikh, as he said, this is proof that uh, strengthens what the Shia have uh, or believe in. When they said, Ali is the authority, the successor after the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him and his family. Numbers, uh, as you can see on the screen, you may call. Uh, now still on live, and if you have scholars uh, that you can call and take part, or if you would like to send something, and, uh, audio, video recorded, Sheikh, I tried uh, to find out what Ahmed bin Hanbal wants to say or what was his point if those who narrated this report what was his point of point of view why did he give those instructions we know as a Shia because he did not want people to know the matter of Ali, peace be upon them. Are there explanations others have made? Based on my own research, they have not given any excuse or justifications for this. The justifications are clear. He is worried. He's afraid of what this narration uh, could do and what it can uh, lead to. And that it will lead to Ali, peace be upon him, being shown as the rightful successor, the authority of this nation. At any rate, this narration causes such anxiety to Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Uh, the hadith of Ghadir and hadith of Manzila, the position of Ali, peace be upon him, in the eyes of the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. And that's why he was so sensitive towards this. Uh, and he would not even want to, people to talk about it. Uh, not to talk about it at all. As for them, as the students, those who followed him, they did not give an explanation, except, I'd say, some of them, as I can remember or recall, um, in some of these aqida books, creed books that talk about sifat or other things, since Ahmed talked about something or made such statements that are similar to this, that we should not talk about the sifat or the qualities of Allah. They put this report by the statements of Ahmed ibn Hanbal and put it alongside those as if they are from the same location or the same purpose. That it is not permitted to talk about the meanings of this hadith or narration. So Sheikh now, we're, talk, we're talking about sifat. We... We leave them as they are, close our minds and do not talk about what they mean or could mean. 
as they claim, of course, and when it comes to Sifat. But this has nothing to do about the Sifat, like the qualities of Allah. But why did they put that with that, alongside it? And that's why you say as an answer, that is something that is to be used against them. It shows the weakness and inability that they are not capable of uh, answering uh, or responding pr with proof against proof. Shia have strong proof, but they they don't have strong proof. And because Ahmed ibn Hanbal and his followers know the proof, so-called proof, is weak, no matter how much they had tried to debate the Shia, and no matter what they've said to the Shia, any debates they've taken part into or want to take part into, any meaning they want to establish, they will fail at the uh, in the end. So the best solution is to ease our minds and prevent people from talking about it. We have a call from Abdul Hamid from Algeria. Peace be upon you. Peace be upon you. Peace be upon you and his blessings. Blessings of Allah. Why did, why did Ahmed ibn Hanbal order students not to talk about Ahadith al-Ghadir? I have two points, uh, a few points I want to talk about them. First, as long as it's a topic, I've been watching from the beginning of this uh, session. Ahmed ibn Hanbal, he is not afraid about what Hadith uh, al-Ghadir because he talk, talked about it in Musnad. Second, Hadith al-Ghadir does not, does not prove uh, that uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib was an Imam. So why did Ahmed ibn Hanbal order his students not to talk about this narration and not discuss what it means? Hadith al-Ghadir. Hadith al-Ghadir. It does not mean that Ali is authority of Allah, as Shia have said. Fine. Then why did Ahmed ibn Hanbal, if that was the case, why did Ahmed ibn Hanbal, why did Ahmed ibn Hanbal deny or uh, prevent his students, or instruct them not to talk about it, or discuss what it means? We want to know the reason. This is not logical statement. Why? Because Ahmed, he has the narrations of Al-Ghadir and Musnad. He put them, he mentioned them, but he did not uh, discuss them. Listen, when we said, we relayed his... Uh, if, just you pay attention, um, that Ahmed ibn Hanbal said, do not discuss this narration. Leave it as it was reported. When he says, leave the narration as it was, let us finish. Let me finish. Uh, and, and you can talk. Let this. Yes, you can. I watch on YouTube. I, I want to just uh, explain my point of view. Brother Ahmed Al Hamid. Abdul Hamid, let Sheikh speak so we can all learn something. Then, after you listen, you will. They will leave you speak and we will listen to your point of view in detail, Allah willing. However, I, I want to just to let you realize something a point you mentioned. You said Ahmed bin Hanbal. He's not uh, afraid of what Al-Ghadir means or to explain it because he included it in his Musnad. I want to just uh, explain something to you that when he was asked what this hadith meant, he said, do not speak about its meanings. Let it as it's been reported. So you may report it as it was. However, do not talk about what it means. So your justification is not allowed, oh, it's not permitted, it's not. It's false. He's not afraid because he reported it. To report a narration is something, but to explain it is another. We're talking about the other thing. Now, why was he afraid of what this hadith means? And he said, don't talk about it. Why? 
I, my opinion, my opinion is, my personal point of view is that Ahmed, if he saw Hadith al-Ghadir, it was proof, undeniable proof that Imam Ali was authoritative, he would not have put it in Musnad. He would have turned Tadlis and omitted this narration or or other ways or reported in wrong ways so it is not there the other is I want to talk about Hadith al-Ghadir we are not talking about what Hadith al-Ghadir means the, the session was not held for this reason the title of this session is why does he instruct his followers if he only speaks you want to mean what Hadith Ghadir means? Sheikh was speaking this as a side note, not. If we confirmed. By the way, you did not ask Sheikh a question. He said to you, uh, to report a narration is something, and to explain it is something else. He, he narrated, and he said, leave it as it was. He said, do not explain it. He said, why did he say leave the narration as it was? What for? Since there are people who see this narration is proof that Imam Ali was authority of Allah. That it goes against the Sunni's belief and he does not want well, people, general people, populace to have the mistakes on belief. That this narration uh, will prove that uh, he does not want that to use, be used as proof. Now you said the truth, brother. This is what we want. Allah be praised. What you say? Uh, Ahmed bin Hanbal is confirming his weakness. I am searching for the truth. I'm not an extremist. If it's confirmed to me that Hadith Khadir is proof that it is about uh, the authority of Ali, then I would follow him. But Hadith al Ghadir is not proof. If you continue to research, if you allow us, just a simple question now. Do you accept, what, uh, do you accept Ahmed bin Hanbal? When he said it's not permitted to talk about Ahmed, uh, Hadith Ghadir or not, Do you, I go against him. I, I don't ex accept that. Why? Because his point was back then is because he doesn't want people to f fall into tribulation. But he allows it this time. He allows it now, but not in the past. It's clear. If you do against, go against him, that's good. If you do go against his instructions, do not follow him blindly, then that's Allah willing, a good start. Allah for We will listen to you, no, uh, no problem. I just want to see my opinion. I'm hearing you, um, I don't want, I don't want to be famous or anything. I just want to give my opinion. And uh, you can give your, maybe you can convince me. Uh, with your opinion if it's your uh, people to become Shia that's good if you want to become Shia what's your goal I want them to become Shia if that's the case then let me uh, put forward my opinion and if you want to respond to me then let us see and if heard something convinces me I'll follow it Allah willing go ahead what I say is that Hadith al ghadi it was in the Hajj, and the Messenger of Allah, blessings and peace be upon him, is martyred in Rabi Alawa, or according to you, at the end of Safar, 28th of Safar, between Hadith al Ghadir and the Messenger of Allah is passing, peace be upon him, at least two or three months, or two months and a half, or three months. 
And the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, his family, when he declared the hadith of Al-Ghadi, he was healthy. He would uh, has his mule, he would be able to ride his mule. He was in a good he was in good health. The Messenger of Allah at that time, peace be upon him and his family. When he got sick, and that sickness that killed him, and he knew he knew that this is a sickness that will take his life. Why did uh, Imam Ali, peace be upon him, what did not take his position when the Prophet could not stand and he forced himself to get up and become the Imam of people or lead them in prayer? And why did Imam Ali himself, peace be upon him, did not take it upon himself without waiting for Prophet? Since the Prophet was in bed, Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace be upon him, would carry out the khilaf or succession uh, 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 duties. I did not see the Prophet, peace be upon him, chose someone as a successor. It was simply, uh, has nothing to do with leadership authorities and others like this. Peace be upon you, brother, and thank you. It's surprising for me, strange for me what this brother has said. It seems like he is the type of person who does research. And it was very good for me, or good when I heard that he said, I go against what Ahmed bin Hanbal says. It's a good thing and a step forward. But that despite all of that intellectual freedom, to let yourself fall into this kind of weak way of thinking is not something you expected. First of all, brother, is wrong. It is not, not right for us to uh, judge the prophets and the messengers based on our own, own uh, biases or our own principles and morals. You said there was a difference, time difference, between the Yom al-Ghadir, or day of Ghadir, and the Messenger of Allah's passing and martyrdom around two months or three months. Why did uh, the Prophet not leave Ali uh, to lead uh, the nation after? He did not. And he has his reasons for this. He obeys Allah and no one else. This is assumed that was was a test. Who obeys him and who does not obey him? This is not our job to question these things. The mistake that many people commit is that they would say, why did the Messenger of Allah do, the, do this act? And he could have done, while he could have done something else entirely. This is a mistake. Wisdom is what the Prophet has done, not the other way around. That does not give you a reason or an excuse to try to explain his deeds and his words in ways that were, are, were not correct or are inappropriate. The Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family said, those who are their authority, Ali is their authority. Allah is an ally to those who are his allies and an enemy to those who are his enemies. Champion, aid those who aid him and disgrace those who betray him. And another statements, other saying, other statements as well, making these declarations, this is all sufficient. Then you say to me, you come, no, I don't accept this meaning or, or this proof because I have these assumptions in my head. Saying like, what if the Prophet, then wh why, did, why did the Prophet not give him or make him an Imam in his life? Why did he not order him to lead the prayer? As the, some of the ignorant opposers said, why did the Prophet not declare that in Yom Arafah instead? It is not our duty. It is his duty. He obeys Allah and he makes those structures based on the will of Allah in specific places and times as Allah has instructed him. And he makes these revelations. Then we put ourselves in a position where we have the right to decide for the Prophet what he should say and what he shouldn't what he should do and who he shouldn't do. And this is uh, uh, really unethical behavior towards the Prophet and an insult towards him. And also, who said to you that uh, the Prophet did not actually use Ali uh, or put him in his place? If you looked at history, uh, at in history, 
every position that the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, and his family was unable to carry out a certain uh, duty in terms of uh, that uh, were uh, regarding rulership or leadership, he would have put Ali in his place, even at the end of his life. And Ali also led people in prayer. But what can we do if you thought reality and history and the sunnah of the Prophet, it, it all comes from Aisha bin Tabi Bakr. You and are the, under the illusion. The truth that cannot be denied, that the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him and his family, uh, installed or uh, ordered that Ali, um, that Abu Bakr, or uh, lead people in the prayer. Why? Because the narration of Aisha. She is the one who made that claim. That the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, instruct Abu Bakr to uh, lead people in prayer. And ignoring the fact that Aisha is a liar. And also that the reality shows, historical records show that she was lying. If the Prophet instructed Abu Bakr to become the one to lead his prayer, why did he force himself to get up and remove Abu Bakr and then he lead himself, lead the prayer himself? You do not criticize your narrations. That's the issue. We criticize our narrations. You think we accept every narration, even if it's authentic? We do not. Some of our narrations are authentic in terms of change of transmission. And it's because we have rules, we reject them. The rules uh, taught to us by the Imams, peace be upon them, that will, uh, will teach us what narrations to take and what narrations not to take. Not just because the chain of transmission is correct, that means the narration is 100% and, and it is, uh, is true. There are many examples. For example, a narration that could uh, go against the Quran. So what do we do with the chain of transmission that's authentic? We say this chain could be, uh, have been inserted. Those who fabricate narrations can also fabricate authentic chains of transmissions. He could put men who are trustworthy in the chain of transmission. So we are under the illusion later when we find this narration that is authentic. But then we will look at the content of this narration. We see that it goes entirely against the Quran as an example. And how many weak narrations on the other hand? It's a weak in terms of its chain. But we accept it and we take, take it. Uh, why? Because it agrees with the Quran, agrees with what's known of the Sunnah and the rules established and taught to us by the Imams, peace be upon them. If you want to research these golden rules by the pure uh, family of the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, you could uh, watch our series about uh, our Hawza lessons for uh, the science of narration. So uh, these are the Shia uh, scholars. We are critical people. We don't close our minds and freeze our intellect in such a way that any narration we have, we do not criticize it. We don't have that practice, but you do have that practice, unfortunately. You have a narration in Al-Bukhari of his men, of Aisha, that's it. You see that this was a fact and it can never be doubted. And this, what you used, is was among the things that Aisha tricked you with. You imagine, you imagine that the Prophet, blessings and peace be upon him, uh, led uh, or instructed that Abu Bakr leads people in prayer in his sickness, not the other way around. It's not the case. If you did actually look or had a critical eye towards history, you would have known that's not the case. And that in every situation, in the, uh, important circumstances, he would take over the Messenger of Allah uh, under the instructions of the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him and his family. Why do you not ask yourself? Aisha herself reported. He said, call uh, my beloved to me. I called Abu Bakr. Then he looked at him. He looked away. Then Hafsa called for Umar. Then when Prophet looked at him, he looked away. 
And then they started looking at each other, Abu Bakr and Umar. He said, if the Prophet wanted anything from us, he would have spoken. Then they went along on their way until Ali was called. Peace be upon And the Prophet called for him. These were the last days of his life. What was the reason? That Ali would be called specifically and the Prophet, peace be upon him, would give him those duties. What did the Prophet say to him, peace be upon him and his family? He said, Ali, this nation will rebel against you. If you found enough men, 40 men, then wage war against them. If not, then remain patient until you meet me. And this is what Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace be upon them, has done. That's because you have not read history and the seer of the Prophet as the sons of Ali have kept. You'd think or you imagine that Ali never asked for his rights. Ali, after the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him and his family's martyrdom, he declared himself as the successor and he asked the people to follow him. And Al Ghadir was used, and Ali and Fatima went to the homes of the Muslims. And then 360 people came later and gave their allegiance to Ali, peace be upon him. They gave their allegiance after the Saqifa incident, after the coup. And then he said to them, You are truthful with your allegiance? They said, Yes. Then come to me tomorrow, tomorrow having shaved your heads. This is a sign that uh, they are ready to go into battle because this is a coup and this is an oppressive regime. And only four came the next day. And then Ali had no choice uh, but to blame them. Say, you did not even obey me when I ordered you to shave your heads. So how will you even obey me? when faced with the mountains of iron you go back and i do not need you and i will remain patient until i meet the prophet peace be upon him truly ali ibn abi talib kept the will and carried out the will of the prophet peace be upon him he said to him you are like kaaba people must come to you you do not go to them the nation must submit to him he must not force himself upon them there is no force uh, 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 upon people in this uh, faith. If they heard you and obeyed and came to you after, out of their own volition, then you may fight. Otherwise, then you cannot. When did this uh, become a reality? 25 years later. After Uthman was killed, third tyrant, they came to Ali, peace be upon him, and they asked him to be their successor. And that they were more than 40. And then Ali, look in Najjal Balagha. He said, because now uh, we have champions, those who support me in this endeavor. And now I must uh, become the successor. And there is now justification for it. But then you come to me and now and you say, after Saqif and Ghadir, why did Ali, peace be upon him, did not... Uh, uh, force himself or declare himself or uh, so on and so forth this is not the instructions of the Prophet do you want him to disobey the Prophet he did not have enough to support him in his fight you must look reevaluate your views look at Sira, Sunnah and history look at what the sons of Ali, peace be upon him, have said, those who know the seer of the Prophet more than anyone else, they will teach you, they will uh, give you the knowledge you need to know what Ali, peace be upon him, has done after the passing of the Messenger of Allah. Not those scholars you've learned from these sessions alone, like Ahmed ibn Hanbal and others, the deceit they've committed and the lies. You, you trust these people and you take the uh, truths from them? Why not from Ahl al-Bayt, peace be upon them? At any rate, as I said, no matter 
where the Sira has led us, they do not uh, make the uh, Sharia laws, proofs behind them, void. We must uh, use that as strengthening the purpose. Imagine some, they say that the Imam, Ahl al-Bayt were not Imams. Why? Because history went against it. They said, Ahl al-Bayt, they were never the true leadership of this nation. Because this nation turned their backs, excluding Muhajirin and Ansar, because they did not assign or accept Ahl al-Bayt as their authorities, that shows that the Prophet never made those instructions. They, he never uh, installed them as successors. Is this not a kind of logic that deserves to be mocked? They are assuming that this nation is infallible. They cannot do mistakes. That the uh, that, that the uh, Muhajirin Ansar cannot do mistakes. If there's proof that Ahl al-Bayt are the authorities of this nation, but history has shown that people disobeyed Ahl al-Bayt, then you must convict the, that nation, not convict Ahl al-Bayt. Uh, look at what the Prophet has said. This nation, its mind is upside down. Its logic is upside down. This nation ob disobeyed its Prophet. Muhajir Ansar disobeyed its Prophet. Yes. Do you not read Quran? Do you not read Sunnah the reports of the Messenger of Allah, even in your own sources? If, did you not, do you not see how many incidents in which Muhajir Ansar disobeyed the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, publicly? So, do you not know that's the case for Sulh Hudaybiyah? He said, shave your heads. They disobeyed him. They did not want to do it. Even simple, silly matters. They refused. Until he himself, peace be upon him, stood up and shaved his head, and then they followed suit. In one of his raids, he said, do not fast. But they fasted, in spite of what he said. And then he called them disobedient followers. And Muhajirun Ansar, that disobeyed the Prophet. He said that. Even things are simple, ordinary matters. So do you think they would not disobey him in a matter that is so sensitive, such a critical matter, that lives will be not spared for, and that people desire more than anything else? Dominion. Where is your intellect? If those people so fit to disobey the Prophet with these minor things, but when it comes to this major thing like dominion, this, this shine of the throne, you think they would not disobey him? Of course, it's a natural thing to expect. Then if you look at the narrations, what the Prophet, blessings and peace be upon him, has said in the 12 Imams that he's promised, he said that this faith will remain uh, sacred and dignified as long as it's led by those 12 Imams. What else did he say in these authentic notions? He said, it will not harm them. All those who dis disobey them and abandon them, they will not bring harm to them. Do you not see that the uh, Prophet is indicating that this nation will disobey these Imams. And this is the truth. History has shown that a uh, nation has abandoned uh, these Imams. Some killed and some poisoned. But the Prophet said, no matter who obeys them and who does not, they will continue to be its Imams, even if this nation does not accept them. This nation will accept and deal with the consequences of their decisions. Yes, Muhammad is a messenger and the last of the messengers. And when he is killed, you will turn your backs on him. Allah, peace be upon him. Allah, apologies, has uh, said, Allah Almighty has said this nation will rebel. So do not allow yourselves to assume that uh, this nation would not rebel. 
دير بروس قناه تفادك صوت العذراء is in dire need of your donations so that it may continue in its efforts do not wait until this voice is no longer allowed to air we need your donations so that it will continue on uh, and providing you with uh, what is needed all of these projects that are led by the Mahdi Servants Union and we are close to Muharram the month of mourning on Imam Hussein peace be upon him the master of martyrs and Allah will make dear uh, our brother now will uh, take over and uh, into the donation programs and I can say to you brothers now that our channels is behind in three months we have 73,000 pounds in debt and we also want to prepare our uh, mosque for the month of mourning decorations and uh, so on and so forth all things that are required uh, for our guests as well and if there's you have any needs uh, and any prayers is a blessing for you and may Allah accept your prayers with your donations
فاو تسالكم الدعاء وعقد الرايه عقدوا لها رايه بالفضل العباس 